Brooks Cope, and I'm the Director of Pastoral Care at Phoebe Ministries, and I want to welcome all of you to the last workshop of the day. And, uh, and up here in this room, the workshop following Dot Shelley, which is always a really hard act to follow. In fact, it's impossible. I don't even know why we're trying. <laughs> don't even think about it. So we want to, this afternoon, talk about music, spirituality, and aging. And uh, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background into um, the topic that we want to talk about. And then we have two experts with us who are going to take the majority of the time if I'm able to be concise. And I will try really hard to be concise because I really wanted you to hear from Cantor Kevin Wartell and from Elizabeth Buss. And uh, so here are our singing credentials and our music credentials. Uh, Kevin is the cantor at Temple Bethel here in Allentown. He's a pastoral care assistant at Phoebe Ministries. He did a unit of clinical pastoral education with us last year. He continues to provide services for the Jewish holidays at our Phoebe Allentown campus. But he is really a professional singer, choir director, and uh, just extraordinary musician. And Chaplain Elizabeth Buss is our dementia care chaplain at our Center for Excellence in Dementia Care at Phoebe Ministries, a position she has crafted, really, and made her own, and she will tell you about some of that. Uh, but she is also a professional singer and actress and has sung opera as well. And she wanted me to especially tell you that. Because it sounds hoity-toity. <laughs> We just, in our Ministry and Business Council a couple weeks ago at Phoebe, we read this book, uh, Leadership is an Art. I, be, I believe it's by Max Dupree. And it starts with this story of a millwright at this company, and when the guy died, and they got to the funeral of the guy, here the guy was a poet all his life. He had written poetry. And they read all this beautiful poetry, and the CEO of the company was was saddened that he never got to know that this millwright was also a poet. And so it raised the question of knowing someone's whole story and who they are. It raised the question, was this guy a poet who was working as a millwright, or was this guy a millwright who was a poet? And I think for the three of us, you could ask the same thing. Are we chaplains and pastoral caregivers who are musicians, or are we musicians who make our living by doing pastoral care. We are all, I think, have loved music for a long time. And I've used music my whole ministry. And when I was in seminary, I did a field education year at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital in Trenton, New Jersey, and uh, then went back there my senior year as an assistant chaplain, along with my wife, Suzanne, who's here, and we each had different areas we worked in. And I worked in the geriatric psychiatric unit, which at Trenton Psychiatric Hospital was a 200-bed unit. There were four different units. A lot of the people there had lived there much of their adult life. They had psychiatric diagnoses as well as many of them now were in the stages of dementia, in various stages of dementia. So week to week, they wouldn't remember me, my name, day to day, they wouldn't remember me. I would do a worship service on Wednesday afternoon, and I was at Princeton Seminary, so I was learning how to preach great sermons, and I would preach these great sermons, and everybody would sleep through them. And then I would, I thought, well, I'll use my music, so I'd sing Amazing Grace, and suddenly they were with me, every single word of Amazing Grace. I would end with a pastoral prayer, and then I'd say the Lord's Prayer, and I'd hear every word of the Lord's Prayer coming through. And I thought, what's going on here? Wow, that's amazing. Then I got to my first church in Hellertown, and one of my next-door neighbors, Paul Rosenberger, was a tall, handsome guy in his early 60s, who shortly after I got there as pastor had a very severe stroke. And unfortunately, it was a very crippling stroke for Paul. He ended up in a wheelchair. He ended up not being able to walk. His speech was severely affected so that the only thing he could say is thank you. And that was kind of nice because on the way out of church, he would say thank you, thank you, thank you. 
and there'd be a tear in his eyes. And you, you could tell he wanted to say more. He wanted to uh, probably critique my sermon. Um, but it was nice that he said, thank you. And if I was left with only a few words in my life, those wouldn't be wor bad words to be left with. So at Christmas time, as we do in the church, we took the whole youth group to go Christmas caroling, and we showed up at Paul's house, and we started singing our Christmas carols. And before you know it, Paul was singing every word of every Christmas carol. And I thought if he could only communicate through singing, what an amazing thing. So again, I thought, what's going on here? Well, we now know through some brain research that music is stored in a different part of the brain than our speech is located. Speech is located, I think. I'm not a brain surgeon, don't hold me to this, or a neuroscientist, but in the Brokaw area is where speech is. And music memory is stored in a different place. And there's some thought that memory evoke, uh, music evokes so much in us that it's probably stored all around the brain and pulls from all over the cortex, which is the top part of the brain, which is known for cognitive aspects of our life and speech and thought, but also from the subcortical part of the brain, which is the part that is involved in emotions and that it pulls all of that together. And I have a bibliography up here uh, on, that has some really good articles on that aspect of things. And a really good book I was loaned recently from my friend Fred Moyer, who's back here, retired music teacher, is Musicophilia. I recommend this book if you want to get in touch with the latest thinking in terms of the brain and its impact on music and musical abilities. It's called Tales of the Music and the Brain is the subtitle. It's by Oliver Sacks. And I just want to read a little bit of the portion of the chapter he writes on dementia because I think it's so telling how he pulls this together. He says at the center where he works, they do a lot of research on folks who have dementia. And that one of his colleagues there, Donna Cohen, uh, decided to write a book. And the, she titled the book, The Loss of Self. But he argued with that title. He thinks it's a great book and has a lot of good resources. But he says that while there are, there are a lot of losses that go along with dementia, the powers or faculties as, as the disease advances, the loss of certain forms of memory is often an indicator of Alzheimer's. And this may progress to profound amnesia. We all know that. And later, there may be an impairment of language. And with the involvement of the frontal lobes, loss of subtler and deeper powers, like judgment, foresight, and the ability to plan. And eventually, a person with Alzheimer's may lose some fundamental aspects of self-awareness, in particular, in particular, the awareness of their own incapacities. But does the loss of one's self-awareness or some aspects of mind constitute loss of self? And his answer to that question is no. He says, yet though one may be profoundly reduced and impaired, one is never sans everything, as Shakespeare said in the play, As You Like It, Remember the Seven Stages of Life, and the last one is sans teeth, sans eyes, sans everything. Sack says, one is never sans everything, never a tabula rasa. Someone with Alzheimer's may undergo a regression to a second childhood, but aspect of one's essential character of personality and personhood of self survive, along with certain almost indestructible forms of memory, even in very advanced dementia. And he says, in particular, the response to music is preserved even when dementia is very advanced. That's a profound statement. And he ties, as you can see, this preservation of music to a preservation of some sense of what it is to be that particular person, that unique person. And from a spiritual and theological position, I would say that person made in the image and likeness of God and ties that to music. So. 
I would also say that, along with James Fowler, that spiritual memories have an integrating function that bring together cognitive, emotional, and physical aspects of our being. And uh, music and the arts certainly help to enhance that faith. And spiritual music especially is learned in community, often at a very young age. And singing often brings us together. There is a deep relational component to music. So I want to end my portion by showing two videos. The first one is fascinating to me in, in that it's, uh, a, it shows Naomi File, who was known for validation therapy. And her therapy is well known in geriatric circles in terms of simply joining a person where they're at, validating their feelings, whatever they might be. And the person she's working with in this video is Gladys Wilson. And you'll see, I want you to watch the, what role music plays in their interaction and in their, in their connection. Can we roll that? Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. You already know. When people are very old and deteriorated and no one enters their world and they're just sitting there, they will withdraw inward more and more. And their desperate need for, for connection is all now inside. And if a person is all alone, even if they're very, very deteriorated, there's a longing for this kind of closeness. Mrs. Wilson? Hello. You want me to sit? Can you see me good? Gladys Wilson is a wonderful example of a person who was in the phase of repetitive motion where people use movements, repetitive movements, because they don't have any more speech or very little speech, but they have human needs that need to be expressed. You're crying. Crying, you have a tear right here in your face. You have a little pain, you want me to touch you. You're very sad. Can you see me? Is it scary? Are you afraid? And if this person sits with their eyes closed, rocking back and forth, and maybe there's a tear coming down. There's a need there. Here. There's a little tear that's coming out. Do you feel it? you feel a little tear? If you here? gently use touch, and I touched Gladys Wilson for the fingertips right here on the cheek is where the mother usually touches a child. If you touch an infant there, it looks up, and every cell remembers where it was touched by the mother. And often that person knows, even if they can't say a word at that moment, they won't talk, but or they don't want to talk. But there's, there's a communication. And that person is no longer alone. Can you let me in a little bit? You think? Just a little? You think I could be with you and Jesus for a minute? Jesus loves me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. I used music, because when speech is gone, music, especially with Gladys Wilson, it was religious music, because there's emotion tied to it and safety tied to it. So I used her old church songs. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. What I did was, when she moved, I moved with her. And when I was singing, because she didn't sing with me, so I matched the intensity of my voice to the intensity of her movement.
And pretty soon, for a split second, we became one person. Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. So at one point, when she got very quiet and very peaceful, and my voice became very quiet as hers and very peaceful, and my breathing slowed to her breathing, she pulled me to her, and I moved with her. And for her, at that moment, I believe I was a symbol of, of her mom. Feel safe and warm? Yeah? Can you sing with me? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the mothers and the fathers. He's got the whole world in his head. The breakthrough doesn't happen every time. The person will not always look their, open their eyes and look at you. But if you keep trying, and you send, keep centering yourself and uh, really look at that person and really mirror their movements. Maybe not this time, but the next time you come, you'll have a communication. You feel safe? You feel safe? Yeah. With Jesus? Yeah. And me? I think that you can leave the lights off because we're going to show another video right away. Um, I just think that's a profound uh, video, profound in the way that I think um, Naomi Files' presence makes a difference. She really, really joins. If I've learned anything from Elizabeth and working in our dementia units is you have to get in close to do this kind of ministry. You have to join and find a way to connect. But ultimately, it's around a spiritual song that wasn't even part of Naomi's tradition because Naomi is Jewish. So that makes it all the more profound for me. She was joining. She knew enough of the life story and life review of this person to know how to join her. And then when I was laying at home over Christmas with the flu, this, this next video came on the news, and I was thinking about this workshop. Let's see. There it is. Um, and this shows the communal aspect of how music can be used with folks with Alzheimer's. This, this is fantastic. Makes me think we need to start a choir. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. You already know. Inhale on four. The yeah. feeling. Keep it going again. Of having stuck in your head. A, one, two. a song. That's what this story is about. The music we can't shake off. That's where the magic comes in. Mary Leonard and Marge Ostrushko they have it there. are the founders of Giving Voice Chorus, I like music. inspired by what stuck with them. We both have had parents with Alzheimer's, my father, my mother, and we decided to work together. Which is why the Twin Cities now has a choir. For Alzheimer's patients. My way. She knew something was wrong with me because I was starting to forget things. When the diagnosis came at age 56, it hit Jerry Parks and his wife, it's, Karen, it's, um, like a brick. It's a horrible disease. It robs its victims of themselves, of everything they are. But the thief that is Alzheimer's has a more difficult time prying away 
our songs. The, the, we know that music is stored in a part of the brain that's last affected by Alzheimer's disease. Love to have my song. The emotions, the joy, the fun, the humor that came with singing when they were 18 or 24 or 40 comes back. I love with it. Rehearsing weekly at McPhail Center for Music, the choir is evenly split between memory care patients and their caregivers. Can't. Good. Can't say it yet. Doris Sterner's condition causes her words to jump. It's frustrating. Sometimes she can't say it. Well, <laughs> right? But she can sing the songs. Mother and daughter crushing stigmas together. It's just been uplifting. It's wonderful. Love, love me do. So don't fight that song stuck in your head. It's just there waiting for a day. You may need it. Boyd Hooper, Care 11 News. Oh, you rock. Right. Minneapolis. Bravo. Isn't that great? Well, I'd like to now introduce to you cantor Kevin Wartell. You have a question, sir? Music is embedded very, very early in our life, you know, and um, we do start making sounds before we have language. Uh, and uh, we often sing lullabies, even to our very, very small uh, infants. We used to, we didn't sing lullabies. We sang Take Me Out to the Ballpark and things like that. But, you know, whatever, whatever works in your family. Yeah, I think, I think there's something to that. Yeah. I'll take more questions at the end. I, I don't want to shortchange our singers who are with us. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to play Symphony Hall once again. <laughs> That's the only real joke that I'm going to tell you because I only have 20 minutes. And those of you who know me know that I could spend the next 10 to 15 doing uh, my thing. But I'm not going to do that. I'll tell you why. This is a very important topic to me personally because my mother, may she rest in peace, suffered from Alzheimer's for five years before she passed away at a nursing home here in the Lehigh Valley. So I'm not just a clergy person, I'm someone who has experienced a loved one who has suffered from this disease. That's number one. Number two, I have a profound experience as a clergy person having to do with my belief in what happens to a person who has dementia spiritually. And I call it Kevin's theology. I have never seen a hospital surgeon, doctor, nurse, perform a soulectomy. Have you? But I have seen and experienced and felt with my own being the response of a soul to another soul. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. The soul is trapped in a body that is broken. The soul is trapped in a body that is broken. And what you saw happening on the screen, and what I have experienced time after time after time, as Elizabeth has, is the opportunity through music, especially music that touches the soul of a person, you get a response. And let me go one step further. The type of response we're looking for, for all of us who don't have Alzheimer's, is inappropriate sometimes. What do I mean by that? Just because we don't see it doesn't mean 
a person doesn't feel it. Remember that. Just because we don't see it doesn't mean a person doesn't feel it. And I owe a lot to a guy by the name of Scott. Where is he? I'm here. I'm speaking. He's not even here. I'll go good. I can compliment him then. He was my supervisor. Oh, there you are. He was my supervisor. He taught me something very, very important. He taught me the art of sacred listening. To be patient enough to let the person we are with be themselves in whatever form that takes. So this is what I've witnessed. I've witnessed going into a person's room who is literally going to die within a day or two, stone hard cold from Alzheimer's, and I whisper into their ear, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. It's the first thing we say when we wake up. It's the last thing we say when we go to sleep. And as I'm singing this declaration of faith, a tear appears out of nowhere. A soulectomy? I was in the dementia unit at Phoebe with one of my co-chaplains doing a Hanukkah Christmas program. I can do prum, prum better than any of you. <laughs> and none of you can sing, I got a little dreidel. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you something. The more we sang, drum, prum, prum, and the more I sang, I have a little dreidel, the more they fell asleep. No response. So I noticed in the corner there was a CD player. And I noticed that there was a Sinatra CD. And I said, could I just have five minutes? And I threw the thing in, and I start, I've got you under my... People woke up. Smiles. What does that say about music and the response it has to people's memories of where they've been and what they've experienced in life? Music. I was six years old when I decided I was going to be a rabbi or a cantor. My rabbi wanted me to be a rabbi. My cantor wanted me to be a cantor. I'm a soul singer, friends. I'm a soul singer. Music reaches me like it in my kishkas. Okay? I'm from Detroit, so it's in my kishkas. Point being that music sometimes can speak louder than words. And on purpose, on purpose, I chose to become a cantor, a chazan in Hebrew in order to move people spiritually in a way that a sermon as well-crafted as it can be will never reach the same soul-ectomy portion of the soul. It's different. Not better, just different. And so there are two pieces of music I'm going to sing, with you and for you. But before I do that, I want to talk about a young lady who passed away long before she should have. Her name was Debbie Friedman, of blessed memory. Debbie was the mother of modern Jewish folk and liturgical music. Before Debbie, Jewish liturgical music came from Germany, or from very well-crafted American composers. And this music was to be listened to, not necessarily sung to. 
There were choirs and there were organs and there were all kinds of things going on, especially in the reform movement. And when Debbie came on the scene in the early, late 60s, early 70s, of course, she was a child of AM radio, a child of Peter, Paul, and Mary, a child of the civil rights movement, a child of camp songs and campfires, and she invented a era of music that touches that which we cannot operate on. And then one day, later in her life, and she passed away in her early 50s, she became ill with a disease that, we, to this day, we really don't know what was wrong with her. It was an autoimmune system disease. It affected her electric system. It was unbelievable. She couldn't, you couldn't flash a light bulb. She would have a reaction to a light bulb. Her, her walking stopped. She couldn't walk anymore. I literally used to carry her to the stage, and then she would walk on stage, do a fantastic concert, and then walk back, and then I'd have to carry her back to her, 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 her hotel room. That's how it was. And out of that pain, she wrote even more about her experience. Traditionally, we say a prayer called the Mishabeirach. It's in your packet. Those of you who don't have a packet, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Those of you who don't have a packet, please see. Uh, we'll make a list and we'll get it out to you. Okay? Somehow, some way. I apologize, but I didn't know you're all going to be here. So, what we're going to do is tell you about this Misha Beirach. The traditional Misha Beirach is said every Monday and Thursday when the Torah is read, and on Saturdays every holiday, and people line up and give people names. The rabbi or the cantor will recite names of people who need healing in Hebrew or in English, and that's it. That's what it was. And that's been the traditional Mishabarach. If we went and visited someone in the hospital, and Scott can be my witness, most Jewish clergy are very uncomfortable with the idea of, will you pray for me? Sure, I will. I'll see you later. When I have services, I'll pray for you. But the, uh, the art, the art of, will you pray with me? That's not what we are comfortable with, and we have to get more comfortable with it. And Debbie helped us. She helped us by writing this piece. What I'd like to do is sing it once, and then after I sing it to you, we'll sing it together. The first time I sing it is for your soul. Close your eyes, do whatever you need to do to let go and feel the healing of the words and the melody. And then the second time, we'll join together. Me she beirach avotenu mekor habracha la imotenu may the source of strength who bless the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Amen. Mi sheberach imotenu mekor habracha lavotenu Bless those in need of healing with refuah shlema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us say Amen. Please join me. 
מי שבירך אבותינו מקור הברכה לאמותינו May the source of strength who bless the ones before us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Amen. Mishabirach Imotenu Mekor Habracha Lavotenu Bless those in need of healing with Rathua Shlema The renewal of body, the renewal of spirit And let us There is a rabbi in the late 18th century by the name of Reb Nachman of Bratzlov, who was a mystic, Lubavitch mystic, but wrote beautiful, beautiful poetry about life. And Debbie took a poem of his and put it to music. And what I'd like to do is sing it to you as a way of both touching your soul and also um, experiencing what healing has become in Judaism. It's, it's very personal. Jewish healing services go on all the time, but there are nine or ten people in the room, maybe five, maybe four, and it's very intimate. It's not a service, really. It's an experience. And I want to sing this song, and then I'm going to turn it all over to Elizabeth. How am I doing with time? Very good. You are the one For this I pray that I may have the strength to be alone, to see the world, to stand among the trees and all the living things, that I may stand alone and offer prayers and talk to you. You are the one to whom I do belong and I'll sing my soul I'll sing my soul to you and give you all that's in my heart May all the foliage of the field, all grasses, trees, and plants awaken at my coming, this I pray, and send their life into my words a prayer, so that my speech my thoughts and my prayers will be made whole through the spirit of all growing things. And we know that everything is one because we know that everything is you. You are the one, for this I pray. I ask you, God, to hear my words, 
that pour out from my heart I stand before you I like water lift my hands to you in prayer and grant me strength and grant me strength to stand alone you are the one to whom I do belong and I'll sing my soul I'll sing my soul to you and give you all that's in my heart. You are the one, for this I pray, and I will sing my soul to you. Hello. I uh, have had the privilege of working with the Center for Excellence in Dementia Care in the Pastoral Care Department at Phoebe Allentown to develop something that we call Spirit Alive. And their special mm, spiritual slash religious small group experiences that we have crafted for our folks with dementia. And a lot of that is around various forms of sensory stimulation, one of which being music. And I'd like to talk to you specifically about that today. And I'd like to start with giving you a small experience of music in Spirit Alive. Um, I need a volunteer close to the front. I think a lot of you here are familiar with the hymn in the garden. I come to the garden. Okay, um, all of my residents know that hymn. So I don't want to put any pressure on any of you, but <laughs> they all know it and they all sing it. And I would like for us to sing that together right now, okay? I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And I always give them a hug. <laughs> okay. What did you see? What did you experience? Thank you so much. Thank you. What did you see? What did you experience? What did you feel? Comfort, kindness, yeah. Intimacy, thank you. Yes, very much so. Yes, anything else? Have you ever thought what it would be like if you were walking in a garden with Jesus, whomever your God is, the divine being? These services are very ecumenical. Have you ever thought about that? I wonder 
What would it be like if Jesus walked into this room and took hold of you just as I just did with my very brave volunteer and walked arm in arm? Anybody want to offer a response to that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> it, it was very calming. It was very relaxing. It really put you at ease. And, and it, it just kind of made you want to come along and sing with you. It made you more knowledgeable of what you, what you could say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. A togetherness kind of thing I'm hearing in that. A wanting to follow, perhaps. Any other thoughts about that? I'm sorry? You're never alone. Yes. 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 Absolutely. There is that multiple, that other dimension of the physical movement. You could be, I'm not could be, you would be amazed at what these residents tell me of their experience of God when we do that. I, I say that as I look at it, there are some positive things about Alzheimer's. It's hard to say. But one of the posi positive things about it is they don't have a problem with what is reality. They'll shift back and forth between realities. They'll shift back and forth between time frames. Doesn't bother them like it bothers us. They, some of them have told me, walk with Jesus when we do that that they actually experience that. Some will start telling me of what it was like to be held by their mother. Some of them are telling me what it's like to have been with their husbands or their wives. It is amazing what that will do. That music that touches that, touches that part of them I'd like to just do another experience, give you another experience here before I just give you a little, a little more background of something. We also do, um, I hope I'm quoting this correctly, but uh, I think Dr. Carney, who's the executive director of our Center for Excellence in Dementia Care, has said there is something like 60 or 65 percent of our skilled nursing population has dementia at some level. These are not folks on memory support units. These are folks just in our general population. So when, when you're doing services for your general populations, if you do that, you're probably doing that for some folks with dementia. One of the types of services that we offer to our general population is called a Taizé service. And it's a wonderful, very focused on music, meditation, silence that was developed in France. And I want to sing something to you without any introduction that I have sung a number of times at our Taizé service. And I would like to ask you, like Cantor Wartel did, if you close your eyes, settle in, do whatever you need to do to get into the music. And then we'll just spend a little bit talking about it after I'm done. What's your experience of that piece of music? Where did you go? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Where did you go with that piece of music? Yes. Soaring. Yes. Does anybody have an idea what faith tradition I might be singing to when I sing that piece of music? Catholic. Yes, yes. It's a 17th century prayer to the Blessed Virgin, is what it is. I loved it when you said that you felt it. Cantor Wartell got at that as well. There is something special, uh, and I'm going to say, and, and Mo, I love drumming, but there is something special about the human voice, 
I don't, it sets up a resonance. And this resonance, I think, is part of what helps in, in working with the folks who have dementia. One of the articles that's on the bibliography by Carol Schweitzer talks about music creating spaces of ambiguity. And I love that because I think when we talk to folks with dementia, what we are trying to do is get away from the linear and the rational. We want to get into spaces of ambiguity. We want to get into places where they can create the reality that we are then going to talk about because they will talk to you very coherently about the realities that we access. And just like you saw with the Naomi File video, folks who don't communicate will talk to you coherently. I don't know why. I don't know all the stuff. But I do know that we can stimulate these folks in such a way that they can communicate to us what is going on in their life. And it's powerful. And music is a very, very powerful part of that. Before I came here to Phoebe, when I still lived in New York State, I worked for as a chaplain at a hospice up there. And actually, I've done it after I've come here. I sing people out as they pass away. And not necessarily with a particular hymn or, or a particular song, but with a melody line. There's a resonance, there's something, and, and I, I will tell you, I believe it's God, that we grab a hold of the fabric of God. There is something that you can get a hold of with music that I believe transmits God to these individuals, and God helps us to have the conversations with these individuals that they need to have to heal. And they heal. I talk to people about tragedies in their lives. I talk to people about unresolved relationship issues. I talk to people about great sorrows who 30 seconds before were making no sense at all. And then they're talking to me because somehow, some way, all of the things you've been hearing about today, Moe's drumming, the visual arts, poetry, music, creates these spaces that Schweitzer calls ambiguous spaces, ways that we can get in there and enter their reality. And it's, it's powerful. It's powerful. Some of it, I'm sure, comes from those deep buried memories. As you heard, there's something extremely Catholic about that piece of music that I just sang, just that there's this wonderful sound of Jewish music. You hear Jewish music, and, and it, it's, it's there, it's in you if you're Jewish. But it's in there in a way that the rational mind doesn't grab hold of it. You know, when um, so the lady who made the comment about, about feeling it, when, when the comment was made, she went like this. It, it's in there, and it's not necessarily hooked up here. And so I just want to say that Music, all of the arts give us tremendous opportunities to have these terrifically important conversations we need to have with these people who are transitioning through the end of their life. Because as all my UCC friends would love to say, God is still speaking. <laughs> and we just have to find the right way to hook up to those conversations. Thank you. We only have a couple minutes, but is there, a, there, is there a question or two? George? For Elizabeth. George has a question. Yes. The, 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 yeah, there is a sacred space, yes. George says they have to develop a trust. One of the things that we do with Spirit Alive is we have small groups and we have the same facilitators week after week. So yes, there is, there is definitely an element of a need for a sense of safety, which comes around familiarity, which they will remember you, interestingly enough, and creating the sense of a sacred space. 
a place that they feel safe. Yes. Sir, one more question or two? We'll be around a little bit afterward too. Yeah. Mine's just a quick comment. Uh, mine's just a quick comment. We have a, a patient that's 100 years old and she's fourth stage Alzheimer's and she forgot that she played the piano. Um, we sat her at it every day and we pointed at the middle C and played it over and over. Um, and one of our staff members do play and he plays well, um, but he took piano lessons from her and she's now giving him piano lessons at the center. So it's a wonderful thing. Music's really truly a blessing. Thanks a lot. Um, the bibliography I, I w we put together is up here on the piano. Unfortunately, I only have about 25 copies of it, but we will try to put all of these handouts on our Phoebe website. And eventually the video of all of these presentations will be on the website as well. I know our um, institutional advancement and marketing staff would love for you to fill out an evaluation of your day today and leave it on your way out. And just thank you so much for coming. I hope this day was a blessing to all of you. Take care.